Hello everybody and welcome to my channel. I'm Chief Sweet and today we're gonna to be talking about my favorite lizard of all time, the Euromastix. First thing, and it's one of the most important things, is that most Euromastix are wild caught. I would say about 99.9% .9 of Euromastix that you're gonna see at expos, reptile shops, are gonna be wild caught. Now there's nothing wrong with wild caught, but it's very important to know this and if because if you get one and they get sick, they have illnesses, you have problems with it, that's the reason why. And it's usually not the owner's fault, it's just how these lizards come into the hobby. They're imported from Africa and it's just a long journey and they're tossed in with a whole bunch of other lizards so it's just a really tough process they come with parasites respiratory infections from being held in cold places with not enough heat scars and other ailments as well so if you get one and it starts going downhill and you just can't bring them back this is this happens a lot with first time euros they go like euro owners they go to an expo they see one they get it they bring it back it starts crashing going downhill and when it goes down it can be extremely depressing and it can even push you out of the hobby but sometimes people come back and it's very important to notice if you are in this situation as well, don't worry, it's just how these lizards are and sometimes it can be very challenging to just deal with this type of situation. I say this because this can scare people or even keep them out of the hobby. When they get their first year mastics and he falls ill immediately and dies, it can be extremely depressing, you feel defeated, but most of the time it's not your fault. These guys just come and starve, dehydrated, full of parasites and sickness. So for them to push through that super stressed, sick, and survive in a new place they don't recognize is a miracle. So knowing all of that, let's talk your mastics. Now size-wise, your masses come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, but most likely the average you're gonna see is about 16 inches. Egyptian your masses do get huge, they're the largest your masses on the planet. They can get up to 30 inches long. This leads to my next topic, and that is tank size. I myself highly recommend a four by two by two or a 120 gallon tank for your Euromastix, most Euromastix. Other, like I said, there's other Euromastix like Egyptians that are becoming more popular. I'm starting to see them more in the hobby. Those guys get huge and a minimum size for them is like a three by three by seven foot long enclosure. Euromastix love to explore and walk around. That's why we need such big enclosures for them. And remember, bigger is always better. Don't be afraid of going bigger. If anything, be afraid of going smaller. I would not recommend anything below a four by two by two. One thing I get asked a lot is can you keep two in the same tank? I do not recommend it myself. Some breeders do however do this, but they have been working with these guys for a very long time. They know their attitudes, their body language, and can separate them if they feel like they need to. Like I said myself, I do not cohab because I don't want anything crazy going down. In the wild, your mastics are a scavenger species. They, If they come across something that they want to eat, they will try to eat it, even though they're mainly a herbivore lizard that may include cage mates. And they're very aggressive sometimes towards other species, even siblings, your mastics, they will go after each other. So that's why it's very important. If you just got your mastics, definitely separate your your mastics. I do not recommend cohabbing, but you might see it. However, a lot of times people who do it are just very, very skilled and have tons of experience. However, if you do cohab, one thing I would highly recommend is just a huge tank. Say if you have like a Saharan your mastics, you probably could get away with cohabbing if you had like a seven foot by three foot by three foot tank. Same like so like. For an Egyptian basically, and you had three basking spots, three feeding areas, and just tons and tons of hides, almost where they wouldn't really run into each other. One of them might be on the opposite of the tank at all times, and the other one's on the opposite of the tank. If you have something like that, I could see you pro probably getting away with cohabbing. Again though, myself, I don't do it. So we got the tank, what are we gonna use for substrate? And this is very important because I see so much wrong info on the internet. It's actually crazy. Not even the internet, even pet stores. I walk into a pet store, I'm like, what are we doing here? And the number one seed I see people use is seeds. Do not use seeds. I don't know where this came from, but seeds as a substrate is a terrible idea. Not Most of the time your mastix, like I said, they're wild caught. They come in, they're scared, and seeds your feet fall into, they don't feel comfortable. It's, your mastics are very skittish. They're very stressed out type of species. So if they're already stressed and you're trying to bring them back into health and they start, you know, it's like quicksand 24 seven, they're just going into the quicksand. It's gonna stress them out. And not only that, they're gonna poop and pee all over the seeds. And like I said, they have parasites. So what's, they're gonna eat the seeds, poop in it, get reinfected with the parasites. It's just gonna be downhill from there. And not only that, it's super dry. Your mastics don't really drink water. I've, I, none of my your mastics have drink, I've never seen them drink water. Some people's do. It can happen, but mine never do. Your seeds is 
really dry, it's gonna dehydrate them, and it's gonna cause stress on the body. So I do not recommend seeds as substrate at all. Thank God seeds are out of the way. Let's talk about walnut shells and calcium sand. Also, do not use those. Don't use walnut shells, don't use calcium. They're not natural. You wanna go for something that's a natural substrate. Substrate is the dirt and the terrarium. Something natural, something that you can find outside. And where these guys are from, believe it or not, it's like a gravel road. These guys, where they live, almost all of them, is dirt, sand, barren wasteland, rocks everywhere, super compacted. It's It looks like a gravel driveway in a lot of these places. So I myself use a custom mix of peat moss, topsoil, and play sand as a bottom layer, and then I get gravel and sand and put that on top. Now I get my gravel from where I live. I just go outside and I get it. Um, it's safe, there's nothing there. I live in Oklahoma, Texas area, and the gravel and sand around where I live is almost like, it just gravel and sand. It's really hard to dig. So like a lot of times I'll just, you have to get a pickaxe pretty much to dig it. But you can do the same thing. You get like river rock pebbles and play sand and use that as a top layer. But it's very rocky and that's what these guys love. They do love to burrow. That's why the bottom layer, I do it pretty thick. I do it a couple inches. The bottom layer is peat moss and place sand and topsoil mixed together because it holds together very well for burrowing. When these guys dig, they'll dig a burrow and I have burrows all underneath my um, enclosures and it holds very well. This leads to the next thing about the substrate though is if you do have rocks, which I have rocks, you need to stack them. So I put my rocks flat on the ground, no, like, no substrate, put the rocks down first and then I stack the rocks and then put the substrate around it because these guys like to burrow and if you don't have support for the rocks, they burrow underneath and there's no support, it can crush them. I see tons of peoples who have lizards, and the Eurmastics, and there's, they die because a rock fell on them. It wasn't secured properly. So be very careful on how you put your rocks. Like I said, I stack my rocks up and I put the rock on top so that way if they dig underneath it, they can dig. They can have a nice little burrow underneath the uh, basking spot, but also it's not gonna move. It's gonna be stuck there. So that's pretty much it on substrate. I've seen other people use other things as well, but keep it very desert, very rocky, that sort of thing, and they're gonna love it. Now that we have substrate, what else can we add to the terrarium to make it more, less stress-free and more fun for the aromastics? What you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna add tons of hides, tons of places where they can just jam themselves in and just lay there. Uromastics are species that love to just cram themselves in the tightest spots imaginable. You're gonna be surprised if you, when you get your aromastics and you build something and you have a hide, you're gonna be like, well, how did you get in there? I've had aromastics escape from the vents of my enclosure. And the vents are like that thick. Some of the babies just weaseled their way out and just took off around my room. I come in, I'm like, what are you doing? How'd you get, who let you? I was looking at everything and I watched them and one day they're just walking around they looked at the thing and they just went through the little vent. It's pretty crazy. Like I said, these guys love to squeeze themselves in. And I think that's what happened. They just squeezed themselves in was like, oh, this is nice. I'm gonna squeeze myself in here. And then he came out and was open. He's like, oh geez, what am I supposed to do? That sort of thing. So I put at least four to five hides in my enclosures, um, even more than that sometimes. I make sure, so the four to five hides, and on top of that, I'll put a humid hide, because believe it or not, you're gonna see people say like, don't use humidity, but these guys, when they burrow underground, people who've researched it, the burrows are pretty humid underground. So they might be in the daytime dry, super dry, but at nighttime they do go to the burrows which are a little bit humid. So I have a humid hide. I have four to five hides. I have rock hides. I have things stacked to where they can go in. And again, be very careful when you stack rocks. If make sure they don't fall, you can use aquarium uh, sealant or like silicone to like hold the rocks together. So that way, if they do go in there, it's gonna be pretty solid. It's not gonna fall and kill your uromastics. It, you gotta keep it safe with rocks. Be very careful. Rocks can be heavy. Remember, it's like three times the size and weight of your mastic, so it can hurt your mastics. Other than that, yes, I put branches in my enclosure. Some your mastics don't really like to climb, but I I found my your mastics Jirai, the Saharan, is most popular. They even climb on the wood. I get my wood from outside. I use oak trees, almost at pine. Don't use cedar if you go outside. Do not cut down a cedar tree or a pine tree. That's not really good for lizards, but. I use oak. I go outside, I cut some oak trees down. You can use grapevine. Uh, I have a Pangea link down below. You can click on that. That's where I buy some of my grapevine. It's pretty cheap. Driftwood as well. Um, like I said, tons of hides, tons of rocks. Uh, my enclosures, that's what I have. Some people get creative. They use like bricks, cinder blocks. Get creative with it, okay? These are desert lizards. Where they're from, it's just barren wasteland. So really, it's just how you want to decorate your enclosure to mimic that. That's all for decorations. 
Next up on the list is heating and lighting. One of the most important things of Euromastics. Now Euromastics themselves, they like it hot. They like it super hot. Basking spot, you're gonna want it between 120 to 130 degrees, depending on the species. And how I do this is I pretty much, I put it at like 120. Then I go to 125. And how I do it is I look at the Euromastics. Does he sit on the basking spot right in the middle, just soaking it up, pancaked, letting it heat him? I'll keep it at that temperature. However, if he's kind of farther away from it, he's kind of laying, like he wants to be towards it, but he's kind of like, oh, it's too hot. I dropped the basking temperature. I've had some Euromastics like it around like 118, 119. It really depends, but they do like it extremely high, especially my Egyptian. My Egyptian likes it at 130. He just lo lo loves it at 130. He'll pancake out. He'll sit, he'll sit there all day long just loving it, loving it. So it really just depends on the Euromascus themselves. And everyone's different. I had same species, love it a little bit hotter, love it a little bit colder. It really just depends, like I said, on the Euromastix. But you definitely want the basking spot 120 to 130. Now, this is very important. I see this get confused quite a bit. The basking spot is very different than the air temperature. Air temperature is like the air. The basking spot is where the beam is hitting the hottest part. Like the sun or the bulb, when it's hit, whatever it's hitting, the center point around that area, that's the basking spot. The air temperature is the air, what you feel around the cage. Air temperature is very important as well. I keep my air temperature around in the 80s, high 80s, maximum 90 degrees. Cool side can be 70s to 80s, but this is where it gets very important. For wild caught, it's like fresh if it's not eating. For wild caught Euromastics, I keep it hot as can be. The basking side, I start off 125. 125 on the basking spot, air temperature is 90 degrees. 89 to 90 degrees, I found it's like a sweet spot to get the wild caught eating. Not only that, the cool side doesn't go below 83 degrees, that's right. It's gonna be toasty in this enclosure. And this can be a real problem with like dubious, I, I don't have a dubious roach enclosure. I, all my enclosures are just handmade by me. You could probably see that. But I, I have some top opening enclosures and a lot of times it's really difficult to get temperatures up that high in a top opening enclosure because all the heat just rises out of the enclosure. So I have a lot of uh, enclosed enclosures or in this reptile room right here, I'll put them up really high. I have the top levels behind me uh, on this side of the camera and that's where I'll keep the Euros because it's gonna be hottest up there. All the heat's rising from the stacks of the tanks and that's where I put some wild caught. Sometimes I'll switch them out and put wild cots in there. That's the temperatures the wild cots usually like it at. Extremely hot. My captive breads are a little better. They don't like it that hot. Next up is UVB, and this part is extremely important. I cannot tell you how important this is. Do not, for the life of me, use coil UVB bulbs. Those are absolutely terrible. Your masks need high UVB. I use Arcadia 14%, 24 watt, or a 24 inch bulb. Sometimes I go up to 36 to 48 inches. It just really depends on the size of the enclosure, but I usually use the 24 inch 14% Arcadia T5's high output UVB bulbs. You can get those on Pangea as well. There's the, that's the cheap stuff I found them and I like to buy on there because I have to buy a lot. <laughs> so that's what I use. You can use a Zoomed tube as well, T5. Make sure it's a T5 and you can get a 10.0 that as well. So now that you have UVB, the heat bulbs I use to get the appropriate temperatures is halogen. I use a 100 watt um, repti bulbs because I used to use the floodlights. I use part 30 to part 38 uh, floodlights. It's the 90 watt equivalent, or if you can find a higher, it's like eco advantage. And they have this thing like now, but I use like Philips or GE, um, just hardware store floodlights. Make sure it's floodlight. They have spotlights and they have floodlights. Make sure to get floodlights. Now I use, I think it's like 72 watt is what I like the, the equivalent now because it's Eco, however, they don't they don't really sell those anymore because of in America at least in America they dropped those because of a bill for more energy efficient lighting. So we're just I now I just use those empty bulbs, hundred watt basking bulbs. Um, I haven't had to go to the hundred fifty watt ones. I just use the hundreds and they do just fine in my two by two in my two by four enclosures. Jeez, I cannot speak today. <laughs> so in my enclosures, like I said, I use the UVB fourteen percent the halogen bulbs as heat sources. Um, make sure it is halogen because it mimics daylight. You want to mimic daylight as much as possible. Don't use red bulbs. Don't use anything like that. You want halogen daylight style bulbs. Make sure it's not LED. A lot of things move in LED. You need halogen. It creates heat. And then I use another bulb, LED light source to brighten the cage up. These guys are from the desert and I want my cage as bright as can be. So I use LED strips. Um, it can be hardware store strips. LED lights are the same everywhere you go. I use those. 
I, they work just as fine. They're just as bright. I use 5,000K to 6,500K bulbs. Daylight, remember that. I don't like the um, like warm. I like daylights. Now we've talked about heat, but what about cold? A lot of people are like, oh my goodness, my room gets really cold. Well, I'm here to tell you, it's okay. These lizards are very hardy lizards. And in winter time, my room, my floors aren't well insulated. So in the winter time in Oklahoma, it gets very cold. I'm talking like zero degrees, extremely freezing temperatures. I once had my Euromaster's enclosure, which was sitting on the floor, reach 49 degrees and it was ter it terrified me. I don't recommend going that low, but it got that low in one of my tanks, so I had to put a deep heat projector. If you are worried, you can use a deep heat projector at night, but that's only if your temperatures are getting to like the 50s at nighttime. I don't think many people's temperatures are gonna be getting in the 50s inside the room. You can use a deep heat projector then because it doesn't produce any light. You, and this is another thing, a lot of people don't, I don't know why, but turn off the lights at nighttime. That's, I don't, I did not know that people did not know to do that. You wanna mimic outside. So as soon as the lights, as soon as daytime is over with and it's nighttime, you turn the lights off in the enclosure and you use a deep heat projector if you're worried about heat because it doesn't have any, and ceramic heat emitters as well. So ceramic heat emitters and deep heat projectors if you're worried about it being too cold in the enclosure. Again though, I don't, during the winter, I do turn on the DP projectors because it gets extremely cold, even in my reptile room. So I do turn on the DP projectors at nighttime, but other than that, after it gets a little bit warmer and the temperature stays 60 throughout the night in that enclosure, I don't use any nighttime heat at all. All lights go off in the enclosures. Also, this is very important, I forgot to mention this, but I use dimmers on all my heat lamps because it's, it really helps to dial in where that heat, that sweet spot is gonna be for the hot spot. That's why I say par 30, because par 30 is just a little bit smaller light, but I do, I like the par 38s and I use par 38s. However, I use a dimmer on all my halogen heat lamps. That way it helps me control the temperature a little bit better. Moving on to another very important topic, and that is diet of Euromastics. Now I said earlier, but I'm gonna say it again, Euromastics are herbivores. However, there are also scavengers coming from the barren wasteland that where they're from, they do scavenge, and in the wild they have found insects in their diet, but it's still primarily 80% plants. In captivity, you don't need to be feeding them insects. They don't need insects. They can go without it. Tons of people have been keeping them, feeding them only greens, and vegetables and they are doing just fine. They look beautiful, they're fat and they're healthy. However, I do notice my babies like one and one years or below, they do like some mealworms. So I will offer a mealworm like once every three months or once a month to your masks that are about one and a half years or younger. I don't offer them to the adults, just one and a half years or younger. Kind of just helps stimulate the environment that they're in since they do in the wild do that. I, and that's as much as I give them. I don't give them any more than that. And some, I don't even give it. Sometimes I just say, eh, well, it's fine. I won't give it to them. But some I do just one mealworm and that's it. Now that we got the insects out of the way, let's talk about the greens and vegetables. So this is gonna really depend on where you live because a lot of your mastics breeders and keepers, they feed them endives and dandelion greens. And I just, I have not found that anywhere where I live. However, I do feed mine mustard, turnip, and collard greens along with spring mixes and tons of other stuff as well, including outside wildflowers. It's very important to know though, that if you do get a spring mix, you need to take out the spinach and the spring mix. This is what it looks like. So despite having so many benefits, spinach is bad for one fatal flaw and that is oxalates. What oxalates do is they bind with calcium, preventing the much needed mineral from being absorbed into the bloodstream. Another warning besides spinach, if you do collect wildflowers outside, like dandelions. My Euromastics love dandelions. It's so, it's like candy to them. They just look at it and they just come shooting. They're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. They destroy them. I go outside and I pick as much as I can. I dry some out for winter. They love them and they eat them like crazy. Now, it is very important if you do collect this from outside to remember that some places spray pesticides and poisons on that. A lot of people don't like dandelion, so they poison it. It's very important to know where you live to keep an eye out for that. You don't want your Euromastics eating it and dying because of that mistake. Now there's just so much to feed a Euromastics greens wise. I couldn't even name it right now. However, you can, I will give you a list called tortoise table, dot net or dot, I can't remember, but it's the, I'll have a link to the description and you could look on there at all the foods. And the reason it's tortoise table is because your mastic share a very, very similar diet to tortoises. So you can see what's healthy, what's not. And I, a lot of times I actually feed my your mastic's Timothy hay, just regular old Timothy hay meant for guinea pigs and all that stuff. And I'll put it in their cage in a pile and they'll kind of run across them sometimes and kind of toss it around. It kind of looks, makes the enclosure look kind of cool, but also they love to eat that. They'll come up and they'll just chew on it, eat it, walk around. They, your mastics do love that, and so I offer that as well. 
You can even offer them spineless cactuses, um, finch seed mixtures, carrots, acorn squash, butternut squash. There's a place online I like to buy stuff from called Super Euro. They are always out of dandelions. So remember, that's why I say you gotta stack, you gotta stock up on the dandelions from outside. But I'll link that in the description as well. It's called Super Euro. You can buy tons of awesome um, like flowers and stuff that's dried out for them. Be careful though, I noticed some flowers, when they dry out, they're extremely hard, hard like a rock. And I, I don't really have to feed my Euromastix dry food besides the Timothy hay because I feel like it just really sucks the moisture out of them. And a lot of my animals are wild caught and I just, I'm always worried about them just crashing again or something like that. So I don't really feed that much dry foods. You can though. A lot of people like to feed grassland tortoise. Oh, my lights just went out. A lot of people like to feed grassland tortoise food and just like kind of like get a little wet or just like put it in the enclosure and they'll eat that as well. But like I said, there's tons uh, your masses can eat, but remember they are herbivore lizards but because of that scavenger mentality, you will see them sometimes dart after insects. For water, you can add a water bowl. However, Euromastics really don't drink from a water bowl. Some do, you might have some that will. I've never had a Euromastics drink from a water bowl, but I will say that most Euromastics are totally fine with getting all the moisture from the leaves and greens that they eat. They're so good, in fact, that if your Euromastic poops and he looks like he's peed a giant puddle, that's all the excess water they're just leaving behind. They had so much water, they're just pooping it out. Next up is gender. How can I tell if my Euromastic is a male or a female? And I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not the best at that. Euromastic are kind of a species, besides the Saharans, a lot of other species are kind of hard to figure out. But I will say, if you have a Saharan Euromastic, the most common in the pet trade right now, the Euromastic Jirai, um, it's the yellows in the red phase. I think it's like an orangish phase really, but they call them reds and yellows. If you look at the stomach, if the stomach is white and kind of pasty, you know, even if it's full grown, that's most likely a female. And if it's a solid color, like it's almost all yellow, very solid yellow coming down all over, then that's a male. Now on ornates, I noticed that um, when they get older, they'll have the, um, oh my goodness, the femoral pores on the, around their, you know, where they poop, they'll have that. And if it's a male, it'll start to just secrete wax pretty heavily. It almost looks like teeth coming out from his legs and they just rub that along the ground. And that's how you can tell it's a male for sure. And also males will just run around in a circle over things. And it's pretty funny, but yeah, like a dog goes running around chasing their tail. They're not only really chasing their tail, but they'll run around saying like, this is my territory and they'll do that. So you will see that if it is a male. Males are usually in your masks more colorful, but some species don't exhibit much color like the Egyptians. And I'm not really good at sexing your masks, so I will give you that. But like I said, the most easiest ones are usually Saharans because of the color on the stomach. Now let's talk about trying to find a healthier mastix. Like I said, most are wild caught. You need to know what to look for if you go to an expo, if you go anywhere, and you see your mastix, you wanna buy it. And the number one rule I go by is tail fat. You really gotta look at the tail. If you look at the tail, you can like, I always ask like, can I hold this? Or can I take a closer look? If you hold it and I just look at it, and I will look at the tail. If you could see the bones underneath the tail, be very careful about that. You can still buy it and put fat on the, your mastics. However, I always like to buy mine with some good tail fat. A bad tail fat will look like this and good tail fat will look like that. The thing you wanna look at is labored breathing. Is the your mastics breathing heavy? Is he breathing with his mouth open and he's just like, <sighs> That usually is a sign of a respiratory infection. And if you do have your mask with a respiratory infection, you need to take them to the vet immediately because they usually cannot get over that on their own. Another one you look for is, are they walking around or are they just sitting still, sleeping in a corner during the day? If they're just staying still and just sleeping, eyes closed during the day, looking kind of not good, usually a sign that they are sick or they're just super stressed out and they just want to be left alone. Like I said, it's not a good sign. You want a Euro that's walking around, perched up, looking around, eyes open, no tears on his eyes coming down, not breathing with his mouth open, not breathing heavily, good tail fat. That's a good looking Euro. And so that's pretty much it, but we are gonna talk about some troubleshooting because like I said, this is a very challenging species if you don't know about it. So we're gonna talk about tons of things you might run into. First off, let's talk about wild caught euros. A lot of times people get wild caught euros and they're like, he won't eat, he won't do anything. And this is usually due to the fact that, like I said, they're full of parasites, so you're gonna have to go to a vet visit. They might have a respiratory infection. They might have some other illness that you just don't know about. So a vet visit is more than what you need to do. And vets aren't, a lot of people are scared of the vets. It's not really that expensive. I've taken two euros to the vet. Both of them got full checkups, parasite tests, 
and the medicine, it was 120 bucks. Not that expensive. That's for two euros. It would have been way less than that. And a lot of times, if you do go to the vet, it's very important to know that the vet is probably not going to know anything about the euro. I have six vets where I live, and I had to call all of them over town when I first got into euros. And I was like, do you do reptiles? And only two of them did. And one of them only did it on Tuesdays and Fridays. I don't know what it is, but people are really scared of reptile taking the reptiles to the vet. You don't need to be scared. It honestly, it's gonna save your reptile. Just take it to the vet, just like people do with cats and dogs. It's not gonna be that expensive. It might be depending on where you live. Maybe you live in like New York City, and it's gonna be crazy amount of money. Then yeah, it might be expensive. However, where I live, it wasn't expensive at all, and a lot of times they don't know a lot about them. So maybe this video helps you learn a little bit, and you can tell the vet about them as well. Like I said, the most common issue is pinworms with your masks that come in, they have overload of pinworms on the in, you know, the intestinal tract, they have respiratory infections, and that's pretty much it. You get some dewormer, give them that, and they kind of come out of it. However, sometimes I've noticed a lot of people have quarantine. They see online, do, do they do quarantine, and they put paper towels and stuff like that out. I have had no success with that myself. I've tried it, but for some reason with my ear masks, every time I get them, I give them the right temperature, super hot. I black out the sides of the enclosure, the whole thing, super quarantine, remove the poop immediately on some paper towels. And I have had no success with that. What I have had success with is just going natural right out the gate. I put them on the gravel substrate, tons of hides, boost the entire enclosure. The entire enclosure does not get below 83 degrees. It's really hot. And for some, that, for me, I don't know, I'm not recommending, but for me, that works for my Eurymastics. And even works a lot of times if they come in and I don't take them to the vet right away, it'll kind of just bring them straight into going because I have taken Eurymastics to the vet, done the whole thing with them, brung them back, and they just continuously go down, just crashing and almost, look, it's looking like they're about to die, they're starving, they're just losing body weight, and I'm trying everything, and the vet's like, you know, nothing more I can do, we can do, we did everything we could, it's just up to him to fight it, and I do that, I go naturalistic, tons of hides, I mean talking tons of hides, dirt, so he can feel like it's not paper towels, like, because remember, paper towels is foreign substance to these guys, maybe not in some places, due to human, you know, garbage, but, the dirt and everything feels a little bit more like home, and I feel like it brings the stress level down, because when the stress levels come up, so do the parasites. When you're bringing the stress down, it helps them. It's also really important to give the wild caught their space. Yes, I give them a bath, but sometimes it's not for a week. Sometimes it's just a bath the first time I get them and I don't touch them again for 60 days. For two months, I just leave them alone inside the cage. If you're using like a 40 gallon glass tank, make sure to cover all three sides to make them feel less stressed. I don't even wanna handle them and all that, but you really just need to leave these guys alone and let them acclimate to their enclosure. But others, it, the quarantine might have worked for them, it just for me, it didn't. Next up is snot. Now, if you do feed, I noticed this really heavy with collard greens, and a lot of times the wild cots don't like collard greens. I will say that as well. Um, a lot of my wild cots just don't like collard greens. They'll eat mustard and turnip greens. And, oh, another thing with that is when I get my wild cots, I go like a week. I offer them two things. I offer them mustard greens, turnip greens, or collard greens, along with romaine lettuce. And I do that because mainly, a lot of times when these guys come in, they're super dehydrated. I'm talking, when I get them, I give them a warm bath. I know that a lot of people will be like, whoa, baths, that's crazy, because Euros, and the Euro community is very um, controversial, but when I get my wild cots, I give them a bit warm bath almost every day for a week, not very long, only like 15 minutes, and I make sure the water level doesn't go above their head, you know, if need be, I can put their head above the water. And I give them that bath, and I, I put romaine lettuce. And a lot of people are like, what do you do romaine lettuce? The romaine lettuce isn't there for nutrition. It's there for hydration. It's mainly water, and I use that romaine lettuce to kind of get them hydrated again. And then, like I said, I offer them two things, romaine lettuce and the, and the mustard collard greens. Sometimes they don't eat the romaine lettuce, but most of the time, my wild cots will destroy romaine lettuce just to the stock. They will just eat the whole thing, destroy it, and to me, that helps them bring them out of that stressed out crashing phase. But back to snot, back to if you feed your masses collard greens or something else, what you might see some white crystals from their nose. It starts to build up around their nose. You're probably like, what is this? Well, that is snot. And what they're doing, your mastics, what they'll do is they'll take that extra sodium that's in their body and they'll push it out of their nose and that's what that buildup is. Now I'm gonna go ahead and end with this. Uh, it's also have to do with the wild caught because like I said, you're gonna be experienced wild caught a whole, almost 100% of the time, um, force feeding. I have had the most trouble with force feeding, but I do give them this. This is some critical care herbivore, and it's really just Timothy hay ground up in pe uh, like a paste. I've also given them like some butternut squash baby food that helped a little bit as well. 
but force feeding is extremely difficult. Your mastics have an amazing jaw where they just clamp it shut and you just cannot force it open. What I did was I got like a credit card and like put it on the corner of the mouth and I had to have someone help me and just kind of like slide it to where it kind of opened their mouth and squirt it as fast as you can. But so I've had a couple of your mastics, like two of them, actually open up. If you kind of put it on the tip of the nose, they lick it and you just kind of squirt it and they just keep on eating it. It's really rough, it's hard to do but that does work. But like I said, force feeding is just extremely difficult. I don't really know a better way to do it. They, sometimes the vets will have like little spatulas and that kind of, work. it's just, I've noticed that your masters have a, just one of the strongest jaws. If they don't want you to force feed them, I force fed a bearded dragon and it's just so easy, but your masters, they don't play around. They're like, I'm not eating, okay? I don't care, I'm starving to death, I'm not eating. So critical care, I'll have this link in the description as well. Troubleshooting all aside, you know it's wild caught and all that stuff like that. Let's talk about captive bread. So if you do buy captive bread, baby, most of the stuff, all the wild caught stuff, is not gonna pertain to you, pertain to you. It's gonna be very easy. Captive bread babies, they just hit the ground running. It's super easy. However, don't get scammed. A lot of times you're gonna see something called farm bread. That's just wild caught. It's fancy terms for wild caught. Again, nothing wrong with wild caught, but it's just the fact that if you do get a wild caught, it's gonna be much harder. They're used to the wild, they're extremely skittish. However, I have a captive bred babies that are more skittish than my wild caughts. Your masks themselves are just a skittish lizard and you can tame them, but a lot of times it's not gonna matter, they're just gonna naturally be skittish. If you see captive bred baby, CBB, that's okay. If you see farm bred, that's just wild caught. And everything else is also wild caught. And that brings us to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, hit like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, drop those down below. I'll see you next time.